grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our message this morning is our gospel lesson, which we heard a moment ago. You may be seated. Well, dear friends in Christ, one of my good friends is a guy named Casey Kegley. Now, Casey and I went to school together along with our friend Aaron Hauser, literally our whole uh, time together, all the way from kindergarten through grade school, high school, college, and even seminary. Now, while Casey was the one who was in my class, I also had a good friendship with his younger brother, Noah, who was just a year younger than us. And it was kind of strange because we kind of shared this common bond. You see, Noah and I had this odd habit of celebrating the things that we actually did better than Casey. Because Casey was just such a great guy, and it's hard to do things better than him. And growing up, I think each of us could just kind of count on our hands the amount of times we actually did something that was better than Casey. You know, it's just kind of that competitive guy nature. But the one that sticks out in my mind the most was an article that was written about Casey during our senior year of high school. You see, it was one of those kind of student of the month uh, kind of articles. And the executive director of our school talked about how he loved the quiet confidence that Casey displayed. And while he was a great student and a great athlete, he had also apparently uh, helped uh, encourage some of the male classmates to go out for the school musical, uh, which was lacking male actors uh, at the time. And so Casey got flack from Noah and I for two reasons. Uh, for one, we started calling him QC, uh, Quiet Confidence uh, for short, a nickname uh, we still like to joke about. And two, it was not Casey who encouraged his classmates to go out for the musical, which was lacking actors. It was me. I deserve to get credit for that, not Casey. Accolades for saving the school musical should have went my way, not Casey's way. I was fine with everything else. Honestly, I was in the article. But don't take away one of my handful of accomplishments. I don't know about you, but a lot of us can feel that way, can't we? You go the extra mile at work, you take the extra time to help a friend with a project, or you use the money from your Christmas bonus to buy something that the whole family is going to love and enjoy rather than just spending it on yourself. And that's uh, one of those things that reminds me of one of those classic Christmas movies uh, that's set at this time of the year, or that's uh, played at this time of the year, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. And if you haven't seen it, the main character is Clark Griswold, and he's just this lovable guy uh, who seems to uh, love uh, working hard, he loves his family, he tries to give everyone the perfect Christmas, and he even shows this uh, by showing that he is going to spend his Christmas bonus uh, to a co-worker. He shows that he's going to spend it on putting in a pool for the entire family. But you see, at the end of the movie, after their Christmas evening has been ruined by a whole bunch of different things, there's things are finally starting to look up for Clark. Because there's a knock at the door, and his bonus finally arrives late in the day on Christmas Eve. But as he opens it, he proudly declares the plan uh, for the swimming pool, and his family is overjoyed. But as he continues to open it, he sighs once and twice and a third time through gritted teeth, and his wife begins to realize that there's something wrong. Well, what is it, she asks. Well, it's a year's subscription to the Jelly of the Month Club. The gift that keeps on giving year-round, declares his cousin Eddie. But that's not the bonus that Clark expected he was getting. Again, not getting what we feel we deserve can really eat at us, can it? When we're not thanked enough. When we're not appreciated enough. When somebody else gets the credit we deserve. It's in the midst of these feelings and thoughts that God's Word comes to us today. For all, we're in the season of Advent once again, preparing to remember our Savior's birth and also to look forward to his second coming. But our Old Testament lesson for tonight takes us back to a time before Jesus had come. You see, Isaiah is writing uh, his book during a very bad time uh, for God's people. You see, the kingdom was divided, and uh, Isaiah would witness the fall of the northern kingdom, Israel, to the hands of the Assyrians. 
And he would prophesy that the southern kingdom of Judah would fall to the hands of the Babylonians. And you can just feel the emotion in his voice as he writes in our Old Testament lesson for today. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains might quake at your presence, as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known among the adversaries, and that nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome things that we did not look for, you came down and the mountains quaked at your presence. Sounds pretty cool. Because the people are longing for the glory and greatness that God should be revealing himself in. Just like in the days when he revealed the glory and greatness way back at Mount Sinai uh, during the people of Israel when they were wandering and had escaped Egypt with Moses. And how do we see God in our gospel lesson today? Is it with fire? Is it with mountains quaking and everything? It's plodding along on a donkey. It may seem a little strange for us to have a reading of Paul Sunday uh, here for our first Sunday in Advent, but it answers a very important question, doesn't it? How does God come to us during Holy Week? Not in a royal conclave, but plodding along on a donkey. Yes, there are shouts of Hosanna, but it's a humble arrival for the King of Kings as he enters the week of his Passion. Similarly, how does God come to us? Christmas time. Does he come in all great majesty and honor? No, but as a little baby being born in a stable, wrapped in swaddling clothes and placed in a manger. Yes, the angels are singing, but it's a humble arrival for the Prince of Peace. It's fair to say that God really doesn't get the credit that he deserves. But then there's us. When we want a good status when we want approval and recognition among our peers for the things that we do well. And it's in those times that our sinful pride can take over, isn't it? Just how, look how good I am. And then that sinful pride can continue in those other times, right? The times when we haven't done things well and even screwed up big time. And we don't want our pride to hurt. Okay, just ignore me, please. Nothing to see here. Let's just move along. We don't like to admit that we're broken. And yet that's what Isaiah reminds us of. Behold, you were angry and we sinned. In our sins we have been a long time. And shall we be saved? We have all become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. In my office, I have this prayer uh, that's hung up right at the main part of my desk. And it's a prayer called the Litany of Humility. And I'd like to share it with you this morning because it's just so, uh, goes with the points that we've been talking about so far. So listen carefully uh, to this litany that was written by Raphael Cardinal Mary Del Ball from 1865. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of comfort and ease, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being criticized, deliver me. Jesus, from the fear of being passed over, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being lonely, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being hurt, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering, deliver me, Jesus. That others may be loved more than I, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be chosen and I set aside, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be praised and I unnoticed, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. O Jesus, meek and humble of heart, strengthen me with your spirit. O Jesus, meek and humble of heart, teach me your ways.
What a wonderful prayer that is. It speaks to our Lord's humility and the humility that we long to have but sometimes and so often fail at. And yet, as we conclude our message today, I want us to go back uh, to that musical controversy uh, that I was talking about at the beginning of the sermon. Because again, it was me. I was the one who deserved credit for getting people uh, to help in the musical. And I still bring that up to Casey now and again when we're laughing and reminiscing about our, our, uh, the old glory days of high school. Uh, but every time I bring it up, Casey's response is always the same. He doesn't say, Craig, you bozo, you got it wrong. It really was me who got people to come out for the play. No, he doesn't say that. But rather, he says, Craig, I know. I wish that they would have gotten it right. And so, dear friends, as we consider those last few verses from Isaiah, each of us are led to say again and again during this Advent season and during all times, Lord, it was me. I'm the one who sinned. My righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. I am like a leaf, and my iniquities take me away like the wind. That's our confession at the beginning of every service, week in and week out. But as we declare, Lord, it was me, Jesus' response is always the same. He doesn't say, yeah, I know, and you're going to really get what you deserve. No, he says, yep, I know. You're right. But it was my joy to make you right. It was my joy to endure the cross, scorning and shame for all your sins. It was my joy to rise from the grave and to declare to Satan that you have no claim on your child. And it is my joy to see all of you prepare to celebrate the birth and Christmas once more as I came to save the world. And it will be my joy when I see you with me forever. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in this Christ Jesus, to life eternal. How are you doing today? Good? Did you have fun at the parade yesterday? You did a really good job on the phone, waving to people and throwing candy out. That was really cool. Well, I have something that I want to share with you today. Do you know what this is right over here? Candles. Yeah, those are a bunch of candles on the Advent wreath. Now each candle uh, we light kind of as we get closer and closer to Christmas as we prepare to celebrate Jesus' birth as a little baby. And the first candle that we lit, which I think is still lit, it's trying to hang on there a little bit, <laughs> but it's a candle of hope. And the hope that we have in Jesus, the hope that we have of the eternal life that he gives us, uh, the love that he has for us each and every day, that's a wonderful hope that we get to share in each and every day, that someday uh, we'll get to be with Jesus uh, forever. Uh, so let's pray together. But dear Jesus, thank you so much for the love that you've given us. Thank you for the hope that we have in your name. We ask that you would bless us as we prepare to celebrate your birth this Advent. In your name we pray.